the world that has been constructed uh, for us in some respects that makes it very, very difficult to deal with with climate change, particularly on like a personal level, as it were. Yeah, well, to, to back up just slightly, I mean, part of the reason I was interested in, in writing the book was, you know, to, to look at this weird thing that seems so unique, unique to the United States called climate denial. Uh, and what I found sort of looking back at that, so it's really hard to understand climate denial as sort of removed from this broader shift to the right, you know, both within the Republican Party and something that I look at and is very close to the heart of the sort of story of how uh, this, this country got screwed so screwed up around uh, the question of climate change is right-wing think tanks, right? So you have bodies like the American Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, you know, people like James Buchanan, the Koch brothers famously, right? All of these institutions are really core to dragging the country to the right through the 20th century. And so I, you know, look in the book about the very fruitful overlap, right, between uh, the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel money and this really broader shift, right, to um, inject some really radical ideas about how the economy works, about how the government works, and what that does alongside these sort of broader trends like red baiting, right, um, alongside white supremacy, which is always sort of core to the right wing project in, in the U.S., um, uh, that, you know, this really helps to take a lot of what should be common sense ideas for how to deal with the climate crisis off the table by the time it enters the public consciousness in the late 80s, right? So that by that point, by the time, you know, by that, it's it's global warming, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, it, it's not called climate change quite yet. But by the time people are really talking about heating, right, by the time people are talking about planetary heating, uh, that the, the the most reasonable ways of dealing with it are sort of out of public consciousness and everything gets filtered through this logic of markets and this logic that, you know, it is the private sector which is best equipped to do anything and the government really can't, uh, can't you know, play a, play a big role in this and that would be a sort of bad thing in and of itself if we were to have harsher regulations or public ownership or any of the things that have been pretty common, you know, to, to even U.S. history, let alone sort of policy solutions elsewhere. I mean, is that why, I mean, because the, as far as I know, the Republican Party is unique in the world of being a major political party that, that, that has, you know, for all intents and purposes, maybe, maybe there's, it's like, it's changing now. To, so they've, they've shifted from, um, you know, uh, it, it, climate change existing to like, you know, whether it's uh, man-made to whether it's really there's something we can deal with. But there, there's no other major political party in the world that has held that position. And it's not like we're, you know, that the, is, is it that we're unique, that, that this country has a unique conservatism or is it, I mean, was it just like business interests here were so um, savvy or adept that they were going to construct this whole thing? Because it seems to me there was like, much of what you, you write about was constructed at least uh, for a large part in the early 70s. And, um, you know, you, you had uh, the Lewis Powell memo that was uh, commissioned by the, the Chamber of Commerce that was in many respects a response to not just sort of the emancipatory things that were happening in this country at the time, but really, you know, what was happening from an environmental standpoint, uh, people became aware of this. We also at that point hit peak oil production in this country, um, and uh, people knew that was, uh, you know, at least the, the, the oil companies knew the, the amount of oil that we were going to be able to produce, at least at that dollar point, was going to drop. I mean, uh, is that what was going on here? Is this like, you know, business constructed this whole sort of on some level like this this massive movement i mean there were pieces there right i mean we had a decent amount of racism uh and but they but they that these things were sort of congealed in some way to pr provide like a i don't know forgive the uh, metaphor an iron dome around the the, the this profit motive yeah, I mean, so you do see shades of climate denial in places like Australia, the UK, Germany, alternative for Deutschland, sort of 
dabbles in in climate denial a bit. But so far as I can tell, wherever it shows up, it really is sort of an export from the United States and often are getting, you know, direct support from places like the Heartland Institute. And, you know, the, the place sort of I came to on this question is that there's so much machinery built up through what's really, you know, organizing on behalf of business conservatives through uh, the 1940s and 50s, you know, for, for decades, right? I mean, Kim Phillips finds great book, Invisible Hands, really tells this story um, very well, but, you know, it it is very advanced in the United States. We have a very advanced uh, infrastructure to sort out these problems. And so when the climate crisis comes along, you know, people aren't stupid, right? I don't think that the folks who are um, who are running these, the, these think tanks and sort of spouting climate denial when that was more prominent in the debate necessarily believe it, right? Maybe, maybe a couple of them do. But what they recognize very early on is that dealing with the climate crisis, right? Naomi Klein makes this point as well. Uh, dealing with the climate crisis requires such massive changes to a business as usual, which is very profitable for them, that even entertaining the conversation of doing something about it is so damaging to their business model. And you know, the US is a major fossil fuel producer, right? We produce a lot of fossil fuels and we don't you know, tend to think of ourselves as a petro state, um, but in, in many ways, right? That is very core to the U.S. identity. Um, And so that is a very powerful influence on how climate change gets talked about to say, you know, whether or not, you know, we know that companies like Exxon and uh, Shell, that they knew very early on sort of both that the climate crisis was happening, how damaging it would be, and what a profound effect their core business model had on it, right? They knew this early on. And so the tactic is to say, well, it's not happening, right? It's this, you know, fun people who will say this isn't a problem, uh, which gets you, which allows you to push that conversation 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, which is what's happened and what's why, you know, we're only now sort of starting to have a productive conversation about this. And that's different, you know, from places like Europe, where even the European oil majors, Shell, BP, and these other companies have had a very different line. I, you know, I, I, I think probably most people in the United States would rather be there. I'm wary to say it's better. I think it's very different. And uh, I don't think, you know, we're necessarily doomed to be behind Europe forever. And there's plenty of flaws with things like the European Green Deal and how the, the policy conversation has been sorted out there. But in the United States, this thing happens where we, you know, it revolved this entire debate around is climate change happening or not and not you know what do we do about it which is a much meatier thornier question uh to deal with and we're only now having it which is a disaster right it's 2021 um these conversations should have been happening 30 40 years ago um, when we first learned about this problem and instead we're just catching up and sort of starting to sort through the very complicated questions of do we need a carbon tax do we need uh you know much broader scale industrial policy these sorts of things which and uh, we're just really, really behind. Well, I, I just wanted to ask if you could expand on that relationship that the United States has with oil, right? One, its relationship with capitalism seems intrinsically embedded in the even just like cultural way that we see oil. I mean, there's like just in New Orleans or Louisiana, I should say, or in Texas. I mean, it's it's very much embedded in a lot of the the way many Americans see the country, which I feel like is unique in its own specific way. Um, just curious if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these pol- these politics really crystallize around the oil crisis in 1973, which you know there's a lot that goes into that, and I I spend a little bit of time on it in the book, but what that really does is sort of question whether the U.S. needs to depend on other countries for its energy, which it always has. And what is sort of feeding into that moment is uh, decolonization, right? There are countries who have a lot of oil reserves who have historically been in these either colonial or quasi-colonial relationships uh, with major oil producers, including companies like BP or Standard Oil, um, which sort of sp- is splintered off into companies like Chevron and Exxon at some point, but have always, you know, had this very sort of bound up relationship with, uh, with, with Middle East oil producers. And so at a time when, you know, different countries are sort of fighting independence battles um, are, are, you know, 
claiming control, right, of these of these natural resources to build wealth in their own countries instead of funneling that abroad, the U.S. loses its mind, right? And that's, you know, how I think how we have to understand uh, the crisis in 1973 is not necessarily as a shortage of oil, which it really wasn't, right? Supplies of oil to the U.S. weren't really threatened, but it was this moment of, you know, countries really asserting sovereignty over, over their natural resources. And the, the, you know, oil sector, the private oil sector, you know, particularly in the United States has always depended for its, its lifeblood on in some sense, minority rule, right? And that, you know, aligns very well with the right-wing project in the U.S., and they need to suppress the right of other countries to, to take wealth, and that happens in smaller ways, you know, in the fossil fuel economy here, right? There's a reason why places like Appalachia, um, you know, even places like West Texas, who just funneled all that wealth right toward the top in, you know, what in most normal, you know, oil, gas, coal producing nations is considered the sort of wealth of the nation that just is, you know, hoarded by a handful of executives who have totally warped our politics, who have really starved whole parts of this country, which, you know, have been crucial to building the wealth of this country. Uh, and, you know, it's, that's very unique. It's very unique to the United States. And I think it helps explain sort of why, you know, we are, have, have such a strange identity as like an oil producer and a major oil, oil consumer. Uh, well, wh- how, or I, I guess how has that been, how has that been so obscured? I mean, not, you know, obviously, you know, but, but how has it not seeped into the consciousness of I mean I always you know like I, I I look at Appalachia and 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 you know I talk to people who are you know in in West Virginia or whatnot and they're you know most of the people I talk to are are like yeah they're they're they they literally like scrape up the the surface of the earth and um and and we're being completely exploited but how is it that but on some level it also feels like it's being obscured and has not gotten into the consciousness of people that they can find that they're, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, th- we have moments in our in this country where people realize like, hey, wait, we're being taken advantage of here. But there seems for like large swaths of, of particularly when it comes to fossil fuel, that that consciousness doesn't seem to emerge. Why is that? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, I think one, right, is just this broad sort of uh, shift in <laughs> throughout the 20th century towards seeing private sector actors and companies as sort of heroes um, and, and making them out to be, you know, the, these sort of titans of industry who are creating jobs and doing great things for the nation. And there's plenty of propaganda um, to feed that. But, you know, this isn't unique to the fossil fuel industry, of course, but there is this logic of divide and conquer, which is, is which is really shot through, right? It, you know, if you talk to miners in West Virginia 40 or 50 years ago, they would not have told you the coal boss was their friend, probably, right? These were heavily unionized industries, fought really militant battles against coal companies for better wages, for work. It's not like they were talking about climate change, but there was militant union organizing throughout the mines from the United Mine Workers, right? And that is systematically killed. And part of the way that uh, that that organizing in the fossil fuel sector is killed off is to pit different groups of workers against each other. You know, I think about Robin D.G. Kelly's work on uh, Alabama and the coal mines in Alabama and how, you know, they would bring in black strike breakers um, to really pit uh, pit white workers against black workers and really break up any sort of uh, any any sort of hint of multiracial solidarity in, in the minds. And you see that sort of across the board. Uh, you know, even if you look at sort of the workforce of, of a lot of refineries that can be predominantly white in predominantly black areas, right? So the, there's this divide and conquer politics, which happens in the United States and also happens at the micro level by saying, we don't want their oil. We don't want oil from, from the Middle East. We want homegrown American oil. Um, and, you know, most, that's not sort of a conscious choice if you're filling up a gas tank. Um, but if you're watching the news, then it's an easy thing, especially, you know, in seeped in the politics of things like the war on terror to sort of point a finger abroad and, and you know, make it seem as if uh, it's so vitally important to the U.S. that we continue drilling as much oil as possible here. Um, do you want to talk about uh, some of the, b- both the um, 
the mark the way that uh, the market solutions that have been that have come up over the years and also uh not just sort of the 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 failure of them to be implemented and maybe the failure of their structure but their function as a way of sort of um limiting the conversation as to what what we need to do to address these things Sure. Yeah. So I look mostly in the book at sort of a suite of policies known as carbon pricing. So that includes cap and trade, which people might be familiar with from policy battles about a decade ago, all called Wax and Markey that looked to implement a cap and trade program in the United States, as well as a carbon tax, which exists in some states uh, today uh, in some some countries abroad and try to trace back why you know, these, these policies become so popular. So on the one hand, it's a little bit of a fluke of modeling, right? And it's very easy within a climate economy model, um, this you know, sort of technology developed in around the 70s um, to look at the impact of climate policy on economic growth. Um, and the sort of main input that uh, modelers have is carbon pricing is to change the price of uh, of carbon and you know what that means is changing the price of oil, changing the price of gas and coal, right? And so that gets looked at as the most efficient. You know, economists still say this today: the most efficient policy um, for dealing with dealing with climate change. And what has become clear, at least in the United States, right? And the book really does focus on the United States, is that it's not very efficient because they're very hard to get past, right? And they're very hard to actually implement, which all climate policy is, but there's a particular sort of playbook which is built up around carbon pricing, which makes the right very good at attacking it. Uh, you know, I, I look at the, the 2009, 2010 cap and trade fight, and, you know, what we see there is this very reliable tactic from the fossil fuel industry, from companies like Exxon to say, we agree there's a problem, right? We agree that climate change is real, that it's bad. They're not denying climate change at that point, even if maybe they were still funding people um, who, who, who were you know, saying similar things. Um, but their public line, right, is that we would rather have an economy-wide carbon tax because that's much more efficient. And this cap and trade thing, this is not you know, what we want. And so what you see is different forms of carbon pricing pitted against each other uh, as a means to battle off whatever climate policy is actually on the table. And we're seeing this right now, right? We're talking about giving uh, or, or putting a, a decent chunk of spending for uh, green investment into an infrastructure plan, right? Those debates are very complicated right now, but what ExxonMobil, what fossil fuel companies are saying uh, and, and did, you know, really at the start of the Biden administration, the American Petroleum Institute came out with a policy in support of carbon pricing for the first time ever. So again and again, you know, regardless of the merits of the actual policy, which you know, I think are, are very debatable, uh, politically it's wielded as this cudgel against any actually existing climate policy. And, and so, I mean, how has that happened? It's like, um, it, it, just, it just muddies the water and basically says like, we're gonna make every step that we take somewhat controversial um, and really, um, we're going to pretend like we're we're arguing efficacy when what we're really uh, doing is just slow in the roll as it is. Yeah, I mean, and there's like that's like the public line, right? Is that we want a carbon tax, we want this more efficient thing, whatever. Behind the scenes, right? They're just funneling money to the GOP, which has a party line that says we don't want to pass anything called climate policy. So that's you know really a win-win. They can water down or confuse the debate about whatever policy is actually on the table and. Behind the scenes, they're just trying to make sure nothing passes at all by funding, you know, trade associations and politicians who are, are working toward that end. And to be clear, the carbon tax, the, the way that it's supposedly uh, set to work is that it just prices, it makes um, oil increasingly and in, uh, in petroleum products increasingly more expensive so that substitutes end up you know, uh, slowly overtaking the function of oil and gas in, in our society. Um, and I mean, so on some level, it basically offloads the pain of transition to everybody but the producer. Yeah, and we've seen what happens when countries try to do this, right? The Gilets Jaunes movement in France, right, was a result to passing a carbon tax. And, you know, I don't think a carbon tax in itself is a bad idea. I think it's good at certain things like raising revenue. I think it can sort of drive certain 
tweaks in, in behavioral, you know, in, in behavior that, that might be helpful to the planet, but to consider it in a vacuum, which is sort of what economic modeling encourages us to do. So think about the world as if it exists in a, in a model um, is absurd, right? Somebody is not going to want to pay more for gas when there is a train line which hasn't been invested in in right. you know 20 or 30 years or there isn't a train line right and they need to drive 30 miles to get to their first and second job and if it's not nestled within a much much broader array of policy which is making those those sorts of shifts actually possible for people and actually reasonable then it, of course it's going to produce a massive backlash and we should say yeah, that's yellow vests for those yes. of us do right. not speak French. Um, <laughs> I also don't speak French. I just I, I also I, I do not. Um, but and, and so just to be clear, the, the carbon tax is, is an effective policy as a rear guard measure, essentially. Right. It's it comes in and cleans up and uh, is an incentivizing you to go to the greener pasture that we've already built. But the way that we're implementing it is we're just pushing you out the door and there's nothing out there, essentially, <laughs> um, and that we have we have constructed. 